there we go. So um, then again, welcome. And uh, um, this is day three of the summer school. And today, uh, the first session of the day will be about social network analysis. I'm now sharing my screen so you can see my slides. Can anyone see the slides correctly? Yes, good. Yes. I will also keep the chat open on, on the side of my screen. So um, if you have any comment that you want to make, please use the chat if you want, or just in briefly intervene and use your voice. Don't be shy. I'm not, uh, I'm not, mm, it's not a problem for that. I'm not uh, particularly worried. You can just jump in and ask. Okay. And, uh, and, as a, as a final bit of introduction, I see Lucia as connected to. Um, one thing it's fair to say is that when we talk about social network analysis in the context of digital social research, we don't talk about social network analysis in isolation. Usually social network analysis connects is intertwined and uh, um, sort of like complementary to a number of other methods, especially when we uh, do uh, things like we do in this in the context of this summer school with uh, a, co a comprehensively qualitative approach. Uh, so social network analysis can be very quantitative. And what we're going to do is uh, a mix, essentially. So uh, we're going to uh, try to make sense of techniques that can be applied in a sort of highly quantitative, big volume data sets and, and make use of the same knowledge for, um, for the study of uh, data from a qualitative perspective. And this connects very nicely, as I'm hoping you will realize at the end of the morning, also with uh, the things that Lucia and Ilir will show you later. Um, so social network analysis. Um, I'm sure, as I said, some of you already are familiar with social network analysis. Social network analysis actually is a very old story. Uh, it's, an, uh, it's a technique. Uh, of data analysis that dates back to a long time ago. It's, it's been a social research method to a degree since the 1930s. Um, and uh, it's sort of like theoretical principle uh, is based on uh, the uh, notions of relational sociology uh, that are essentially the core of uh, the theory of sociologist Georg Simmel, who was a, a very important sociologist in uh, especially uh, setting the uh, notions of, uh, again, relations and social relations as a key kernel of uh, understanding society. Social network analysis represents a holistic approach uh, to the study of relational connections. So it takes relational connections as the unit of analysis uh, in its activity. And, and it looks for um, individual actors and their role in a certain context in uh, relational, again, uh, perspective with the other actors, uh, the ways in which these connections form and create outcomes, and they are uh, complementary to others. Uh, and what kind of structural properties uh, these uh, aggregations have uh, in, in general terms. Um, the typical uh, sort of like textbook, or shall I say old textbook kind of uh, definition of social network analysis has been for a long time, that is a technique in search of a theory. Social network analysis essentially developed and sprung out when it began uh, to be used as a, a technique of analysis, which um, despite the Simelian roots was um, difficult to apply in a number of ways. Uh, difficult meaning that uh, it, um, in, in terms of research questions and topics, uh, not all topics, of course, not all uh, research themes are suited for a network approach, or at least were before social media. Um, to the point that um, this definition, a technique in search of a theory, materialized in um, particular when it comes to the study of social capital. Uh, social network analysis has been uh, associated to the study of social capital. I'm sure mm, you're familiar with the concept here and I don't have to explain uh, in detail what social capital is. That's the part I do with my own younger students. Uh, but um, social network analysis has become a, um, over the years, a um, sort of leading go to, oops, sorry, I had a, uh, noise in my head, um, a go-to theory, a go-to method, sorry, <clears throat> for um, 
the study and the empirical um, measurement, so to speak, of social capital. That's how we get to this point. Um, and people like Mario Diani, who has uh, been mentioned before, are uh, people who have been fundamental in uh, the development of techniques uh, of social network analysis over the course of the years in Italy and beyond. Again, a very basic definition. So in order to understand what social network analysis, we have to first make sense of what is a social network. Anything can be a social network. I'm sure you're familiar with surrounded by networks um, from you know the, um, the network, the map of the metro in you know you know urban context to to systems of computers to um, networks of hotels, and cha interrelated chain groups or whatever. Um, for sociologists, a network, a social network is an inf a usually interconnected uh, group or association of individuals. Uh, that's a sort of traditional definition, uh, like friends or professional colleagues, uh, which we translate into a finite set of actors, uh, whereby uh, we study the relations and uh, those relations define uh, the ways in which their uh, positions in the context of the network uh, are and what kind of outcomes can they take from uh, these particular positionings and their features, because uh, of course each of these actors, these social actors that we take uh, into consideration are um, individuals, if we look at individuals, with specific features. So embedded in networks are also properties related to not just the way in which relations form, but also how individuals, uh, individual nodes, as we're going to learn to call them, are um, are embedded with so the idea that uh, a certain uh, tie, for instance, as um, which means a um, connection between one node to another, has a um, a certain value depending on a certain feature. Uh, this can also be embedded in networks. It's not just a um, descriptive uh, observation of the ways in which relationships uh, exist between different actors. It's also a very uh, sort of uh, quantitative in the sense of uh, property-driven description. We do not simply look at how uh, something is uh, draw, uh, but um, we, we try to, as a social network analyst, we try to make sense of uh, why certain people are connected in a certain way on the basis of their individual features. Basic lexicon of social network analysis is um, what follows in these slides, um, in this particular one. Um, in, in particular, uh, it uh, is uh, uh, we, we talk about a node when we generally uh, see uh, the individual actor or the individual entity that we take uh, as we are getting closer to our context of digital research. So uh, each member that belongs to a node, each um, individual object is, uh, that belongs to the network is called the node. The connections that um, connect, again, sorry, the different nodes are called edges or ties. This depends on what textbook you have in your hands, really, or your, what, which article, uh, it's, it's sort of interchangeable. And um, generally they are connected and visualized in the form of a network graph. Uh, which is also called sociogram. So uh, the one on the uh, right uh, hand side of the screen with these different lines connecting each dot is, um, is a network graph. And there are different kinds of network graphs, of course, that uh, we're not really indulging here for reasons of time, but I point you to any very basic uh, handbook of social network analysis. Traditionally, they will talk about network graphs and types of networks uh, much more extensively than we can do here um, in, uh, um, in the context of only one hour and a half and uh, where we are going to dig a little deeper in uh, the um, study of digital networks in a moment. Uh, one, uh, there are two things actually that are quite important to keep in mind in our conversations are the following. When we um, see these nodes connected uh, with one another in the context of networks, uh, sometimes, uh, not all the time, but sometimes we have to pay attention to the direction of the tie. Um, 
there may be directed ties, uh, which means uh, that they have uh, the form of an arrow, as you can see on the left hand side of the screen, uh, which go from uh, B to A in this case, uh, or undirected ties, which mean uh, tie that ties that are not uh, necessarily, um, they do not necessarily present a direction from a node to another, which means the connection exists, but it is uh, there is no indication of a uh, qualitative or quantitative property attached to the edge that we are looking at. Um, in the context of social media research, this can be easily translated into the ways in which social relations take place on two different social media, two of the main ones. So typically we look at Facebook connections as undirected ties, so uh, individual A and individual B are friends on Facebook. And normally, when if we uh, do a network of Facebook connections, uh, which we are not for um, all kinds of reasons that we have explored today, um, we typically eventually find, um, or we will typically draw these connections as undirected. Conversely, in on Twitter or Instagram, you typically uh, would uh, find that connections are directed. It doesn't mean you have to draw them as directed. You can also use uh, these connections and analyze them as undirected because it depends on the research question. But typically, if uh, user B follows A on Twitter, it means we have the potential to have a directed tie there. And the same goes for Instagram. When you have the following principle in, in social network analysis, this translates into a directed tie. And also something that, uh, that is important to keep in mind is that we have, generally speaking again, two types of networks that we are uh, looking at. So usually we can look at uh, ego networks, which means networks that derive from uh, the uh, properties or the relations uh, that an individual user has in, uh, context, in a particular context with uh, others. Uh, ego networks are those that derive from an individual user or full networks. And, and uh, in the context of social media research, full networks are pretty much impossible to have because um, you would need the data of the whole platform to actually do a network uh, analysis of that. Some people have done this, and I'll tell you about it in a moment. But uh, typically, when we do social network analysis in digital media context, we look at ego networks. That's uh, as simple as that. Uh, full networks, as I said, are um, beyond, usually beyond the capacity of um, individual researchers or universities. It's something that uh, if you're uh, lucky, you can go work for Facebook and they make you work on full network data sets because they have it and they don't give it to us. So that's, uh, that's as basic as that. Is everybody okay so far? Yes, thank you. Because I don't really see you, so I, I wanted to be sure you're still here and I'm not talking in a void. Yes, it's clear, okay. thanks. Okay. It's going fine for now. So this is a sociogram, a network graph, another example. Uh, we can play a game here if you like. Um, maybe we can start thinking about in network terms who of these nodes is the most central. I'm not sure if you have any ideas on who is the most central or most relevant eventually. We can keep it a little bit more descriptive so far. Um, who do you think is the most important network, uh, node in this network? Alison. Is anyone in agreement with uh, Petra, I think, if I... Uh, yeah, I think Alison too. Let's, yeah, let's try to keep it, uh, keep it ordered. So uh, uh, who is speaking now, Massimiliano, right? Yes. Okay, go on. Me? Should I yes, go? please. I think it, it's Matt because uh, many of these relationships start from him, while uh, Alison is still an important node. Uh, so, so some people say uh, Alison, right? Yeah. Did I get it right? Stella as well, because Stella yeah, has uh, both um, both ways um, relationships. Okay. Any other ideas? Any other thoughts that come to anyone else? 
Yeah, I guess it could be like Allison and Stella because uh, they are the most uh, central and connected with the most of the people around the network. Mm -hmm. So Alison, Stella, and Matt are also Matt is also quite uh, important for uh, um, what on the basis of what Massimiliano said. So yes, oh, sorry. please, of course. <clears throat> Of course. I wanted to go out on a limb and say Simon. Uh, Simon has three arrows leading away from him. Matt, Matt almost seems like a side conversation or a side. That was what I was thinking. But. OK, so uh, to a degree, all you've said is correct. <laughs> so and the point is that it depends on which um, perspective of observation you take. And that's the whole point here. So when we look at the network, we generally speaking, do not only have one way of looking at it. We do not only have one measure of centrality, that's the way we're going to call it, um, that, uh, that allows us to, to be certain about a certain uh, interpretation of their relationships. Of course, we can pin down individual measures. So even in this network, we can uh, make sure uh, numerically sort of pin down the amount of ties that go in and out of a node like Alison, for instance. Um, and, but, but then, of course, it doesn't stop there, especially when you have this sort of like smaller or qualitatively analyzable networks like this one. Um, it really depends on which kind of perspective you're taking. Uh, so, so Stella is uh, and Alison are definitely uh, central here. I, in my in my view, um, Alison is um, important because it has what we are going or she has sorry what we are going to call uh, an uh, um, a mean degree centrality. So uh, a lot of users point to her uh, and Stella. Uh, while, while much less users uh, are those that Alison points to. So uh, this is a difference in the way in which we can interpret her relative positioning. And the same goes for Stella, uh, with the difference that Stella has uh, an equal number of ties going in and out of her. So uh, she has a relative position that is different from that of Alison because of that. And Matt, people point to Matt. Matt is actually quite important here. Uh, because uh, is what we're going to call a bridge. So um, Matt is a node that uh, connects to a portion of the network that otherwise would be disconnected from the rest. But without Matt, we would not have any connection to Sam and Laura. Sam and Laura would be like poor Ed. Poor Ed is the guy on the right hand side who nobody likes. And um, so you see that depending on the research question you have, uh, some of these uh, might be more important than others, some of these uh, nodes, and uh, eventually some of these connections may be too. I see Simiran has a comment here, entirely tangential, but this reminds me a little bit of sociometric mapping of kinship relations. Yes, there is a, a absolutely a bit of that. I think it's not coincidental that uh, uh, some of these techniques eventually became uh, more or less agreed in social research around that time. So um, I guess that in different perspectives and from different disciplines, uh, these, this was the case around the same time that people began to uh, make sense of networks in this way. So that's a fair point. One of the most famous uh, researches done with social network analysis is the Milgram experiment, uh, which is um, an experiment that uh, Stanley Milgram, a mathematician, conducted in the US, essentially asking uh, a set of contacts to uh, send, uh, uh, to pass on a letter from a uh, point to another, so from Omaha in Nebraska to Boston, and um, different from different times, um, different paths, and used their own personal contacts to do this. And uh, he uh, then took trace, uh, kept trace of um, these uh, uh, these different passages, and he um, came to a conclusion that uh, the uh, amount of times, on average, the amount of passages, the amount of steps that take from uh, for a letter to go from Omaha to uh, Boston was uh, six. And that's uh, what gave light to the uh, um, theory that we are probably mostly also 
uh, accustomed to in relation to social networks, which is also quite used in the uh, common uh, sense talking, not just sociological uh, talking, that is the six degrees of separation, uh, which uh, has been translated into the, uh, again, the commonsensical statement, we are all six uh, steps away from one another, uh, which is an average, of course, and this is an American experiment. So um, who knows if this is actually true in other contexts, but um, it is helpful because um, at, a, at least a metaphorical level, uh, this experiment is uh, illustrative of the ways in which networks are much smaller than we think of. And that is quite true. Uh, typically, we tend to think uh, of people uh, on the other side of the world as completely far away from us and uh, uh, completely uh, disconnected from us. And in fact, uh, they are not. There's a lot more uh, connections that we can uh, uh, imagine uh, that, that connect us quite quickly to people on the other side of the world, especially nowadays that we live in a globalized world. So uh, it's less uncommon to have contacts in friends in different parts of uh, the globe for those who believe it's a globe, of course. I mean, people, some people don't, uh, but uh, that's a different story. And this is uh, related to another famous uh, theory in social network analysis, which is the small world theory. Uh, so on the basis of the Milgram experiment in uh, 2003, um, a, set, a group of researchers uh, did the same kind of experiment uh, using uh, emails and found out uh, that you know, more or less uh, the same applied. Um, interestingly, uh, more recently in 2011, uh, researchers on Facebook did a full network, again, uh, study of uh, what Facebook used to be back then and found out that on average, uh, each Facebook user was separated from another random Facebook user uh, by um, four uh, steps. So a little less than, uh, uh, than uh, what Milgram found out. Um, and of course, this is a sort of more mathematically driven, uh, large scale, big data kind of analysis, what we would call now. Um, and all of these point to the idea, to the relevance, empirical re relevance, of course, of the idea of the small world effect, uh, which means that uh, we typically tend to consider um, social networks as large and, uh, and uh, individuals in a social network as like ourselves, even uh, very distant from one another. And in fact, we're not. And uh, uh, if uh, you become, uh, if you want to um, continue your, your career in academia, you will find out that this is actually very, very true. Academia is a small world and uh, people tend to know one another and tend to, you know, know someone who knows one another quite uh, uh, quite easily. And in order to explain this, I uh, just a bit of a digression. I, um, when I do this class or this kind of class at a, a postgraduate level, but um, you know, your master students, friends, I tend to um, show a clip of um, uh, Saul Goodman. I'm sure some of you might know what I'm talking about. Saul Goodman is um, Breaking Bad's uh, bad lawyer. Uh, and at some point, um, Walter White and uh, his gang have a problem and go to him and uh, um, and he goes into this uh, tirade and he talks about uh, knowing a guy who knows a guy who knows some other guy who knows another guy who knows some other guy. And that's how my students understand networks by uh, relying on, so, on, on Saul Goodman. I'm not sure if this is any particularly pedagogical, uh, pedagogically good, but that's, uh, that, that helps in uh, visualizing uh, what this small world theory uh, actually means. And again, this is, we're not going to play this, but I leave it here for your uh, enjoyment uh, later this afternoon. This is the Oracle of Bacon. Uh, this is a, a, a website which um, some um, people who probably do not have anything better to do have created to explain um, so social networks to students by using uh, movies that Kevin Bacon and other actors have been in. So you can, uh, by clicking on this link, you go on a, on a, uh, on a website which uh, will allow you to um, connect Kevin Bacon to any other actor in Hollywood and uh, see how many uh, degrees of separation he has from basically anyone else. And that's quite, again, uh, uh, funny, but um, it gives you the idea that, uh, you know, the small world 
theory and how relevant it is in the understanding of networks broadly intended. So let's get to the, to the real deal here. Um, why social network analysis is useful uh, in the context of digital research. And I, first of all, I have to make a disclaimer. Uh, I connect here to what um, Alessandro Caliandro said earlier yesterday, earlier uh, yesterday morning, uh, when he talked about virtual uh, methods and the virtualization of methods. I'm sure you're, um, you remember that he said that uh, one of the things that digital methods are uh, particularly good at or have been particularly instrumental in, in the context of uh, social research online from an epistemological perspective is to point to the idea that we need natively digital methods instead of virtualizing methods, uh, which means instead of adapting existing research techniques and approaches to a different context. And typically when I do this class to more advanced students like you, uh, the question comes naturally. Uh, if this is the case, if we are talking about uh, digital methods as a as an approach that is based on the idea of uh, natively digital techniques uh, that would help us in um, analyzing social uh, data, social media data. Then, uh, um, then why we are using this virtualization here again? Because that's what uh, at a very simple level might uh, might look like that we are actually virtualizing social network analysis. Uh, why are we taking techniques that belong and exist and have existed for a long time and essentially adapt them to uh, the context of social media? Now, the answer to this critique in my uh, reading, at least, and in the book uh, that uh, Alessandro and I wrote, I, I write about this a little bit more extensively, um, it is quite clear. Uh, it's not that we are adapting social network analysis to the online world. Uh, what we are looking at is a natively networked social context. So it is inevitable that social network analysis comes handy here because as Norce Mares says, digital data are intrinsically networked and social. That's how infrastructures of uh, relations in the context of the online world actually uh, unfold and develop the ways in which we conceive of digital data infrastructurally in the context of social media platforms is by data points that uh, embed networked and social features at the same time. And therefore, it's not us going to social network analysis. Is Social network analysis is already there. We find it in the context of social media, naturally. There is no other way possible to do this. Uh, it's not that we are virtualizing as a arbitrarily virtualizing, let's say, uh, uh, techniques that existed before this. It's that these techniques are the only way as according to the natively uh, produced data uh, that we are facing uh, that, that we can use here. There is no other option. And of course, what we need to do is to make sure that the way in which we do social network analysis is actually natively digital. So we are not importing uh, arbitrarily uh, a number of uh, features and, and activities that uh, do not belong to the digital world, but we have to create a set of activities by applying these same principles in ways that are natively digital. That's what we are trying to do here. That's what we're doing today. Um, and of course, social network analysis is very useful because uh, it gives us uh, already, sort of ready at hand, these sets of principles and concepts, also theoretically, of course, that are useful to study social interaction online. And some of it are effective in the similar way in the digital context, like uh, network properties, like uh, measures of centrality, centrality measures, sorry. Uh, and, and of course, it allows us, this kind of set of techniques allows us to um, make sense of big data sets. Now, that's not necessarily what we're going to do here because we tend to maintain a qualitative standpoint. So perhaps we tend to we start from the big, but then look for the small in a way. But uh, social network analysis and its principles are actually very useful to the understanding of social networks, also very big social networks online.
So again, as a matter of a uh, uh, very brief uh, introduction, I'm sure I'm, I'm conscious I'm, uh, uh, of time, so I don't want to mm -hmm. monopolize this with uh, uh, boring stuff, but um, it is important to know that, that again, basic, uh, basically what we've done earlier, depending on which centrality measures we are looking at, we have and we may have different results. So um, centrality measures are typical of social network analysis as these are measures and calculations that have a mathematical nature at its back. So uh, it's uh, in principle a mathematical calculation that um, allow us to um, pin down who is most central, AKA most relevant in the network. Although it doesn't necessarily mean that the most relevant people in the networks are also those most central, we'll say. Um, so typically when we look at networks, we find, uh, we go look for um, degree centrality. So uh, the amount of ties that go in and out of a given network. When we, uh, this is, I uh, want to be precise here, especially for those who are unfamiliar with this jargon, when we talk about degree centrality, we talk about the sum of ties that go in and out of a given node. So when you see degree, you do not distinguish, at least at the first level, between the amount of ties that go into a node and the amount of ties that go out from a node to another node. Degree centrality is the sum of both. Then it is important if we are, uh, you know, depending on our research question, um, perhaps it is important to distinguish between in-degree centrality and out-degree centrality. In-degree centrality is the amount of ties that go into a node so that other nodes point to a certain node in the network. And this is typically a reputational measure, or at least, you know, a start to understand reputational connections. Uh, a lot of users, a lot of nodes point to a given user or node. Uh, why? That's a question that we want to ask. And of course, out degree, uh, again, I'm talking in a you know, simplest of terms here, uh, says that um, if I am, if a lot of users, if, if I point to a lot of users, I might have a fair amount of social capital in that particular network. I have a lot of connections that I point to. It can or cannot be reciprocated. It doesn't really matter yet, but it is uh, the way in which, uh, you know, it, it, the way in which these networks, these, sorry, these connections actually uh, point or are pointing to a certain node, something that we might keep into consideration. But degree centrality, and that's what matters here, is not the only uh, one uh, that we can use. Uh, we can also, in uh, general network analysis terms, we can use other measures, and I highlight here other three, which I think are quite important, and there are, I'm sure, others that I forget. I uh, also uh, ask the people who are more, more familiar already with um, social network analysis, perhaps they can point me to my gaps in the uh, in the PowerPoint, and if there is something I forgot, please please say. So, other three measures that I find quite uh, uh, useful are closeness centrality, which is a measure of centrality that tells us about how a certain node is distant on average to all the other nodes. Again, it's a mathematical calculation. This means that um, you're typically uh, in uh, the context of uh, dense informational networks or not. That's the kind of role that closeness, closeness centrality does. So uh, higher closeness centrality of a, go, of a node, it means that it is likely this node is an informational hub. Betweenness centrality instead gives uh, the uh, calculation, the measure of how often a node appears to be on the shortest path between any other node in the network. Why this matters? Because nodes with high betweenness centrality are probably likely to be bridges or brokers, which is slightly different, but the, the concept is relatively similar. I know Mario Diani would disagree with this, but um, uh, because it's too simplistic, but that's technically uh, more or less similar. The idea that is that uh, if, you're, uh, if you have a higher betweenness centrality, you're likely to be able to intermediate 
the flow of information in a given network. And that is a relevant role because it carries a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, weight in terms of uh, certain information going from a place or a node to another or a group of nodes to others. And finally, the one that I point at because it's also in Jeffy, which we are about to see, is eigenvector centrality. Eigenvector uh, is a, um, a centrality measure that points that calculates how much a certain node is connected to other central nodes. And this is the di most direct calculation of reputational, um, of reputational relevance in a network because I have a higher eigenvector centrality if I am connected to other people who have higher eigenvector centralities, so to have, who have higher centrality measures. Uh, and this is a calculation that takes sort of, so to speak, comprehensively centrality measures into the picture. And, and it is the most direct um, reputational measure that we can rely on. If we are looking for reputation in a network, which might be uh, typical somehow, uh, in, in especially when we're looking at Twitter networks uh, and users that are able to convey or uh, circulate certain informations, uh, then of course, uh, reputation is quite important in that particular uh, context. So depending on the network we have in front and the kind of research questions and goals we have in mind, um, we can use one or a combination of these centrality measures to make sense of our data. Another exercise here. Um, I hope you can see the picture here in the same, in a better way than I can see from my screen. So um, generally I ask, uh, who is the most central here? Again, as an exercise, who would you suggest um, these are the nodes that are more uh, central here? In the meantime that you think about it, I want to highlight a very appropriate comment by Dominic, uh, who uh, also uh, points us to beta centrality, which is, uh, which is very appropriate if you want, uh, perhaps you want to elaborate a little bit on this, Dominic? Well, truth be told, I, I don't remember all that much, uh, but okay. um, the, no worries. Both, both the concepts of the K step and beta centrality came down to the difference between directed and undirected networks. And basically the beta centrality and the K step centrality are according to certain authors, mainly Borgatti, Everett, and Johnson, yeah. uh, suits better directed data. So uh, you use beta centrality instead of agent vector centrality for direct networks. And you typically prefer case step reach over the, uh, the closeness centrality, again, for uh, directed data. Thank you. This is very helpful because it helps me to say that, of course, there is a whole world outside these slides that uh, have been researching social networks since a long time. And the uh, guys that uh, Dominic has mentioned, Steve Borgatti, Patrick Everett, I think it's a term, the, the name of the guy, the first name, I don't remember. Um, Martin. And Martin, sorry, thank you. Uh, and there's a, there's a, there's a, set of very important scholars that have spent their whole research careers uh, researching uh, these uh, these measures and, and the way in which we make sense of networks also mathematically. So if those uh, of you who are, for those of you who are more interested in, uh, or might be more interested in expanding, uh, of course, these, uh, this, this set of uh, knowledge about networks, I can point you to some of these people's readings. There is another concept that I don't mention here and that helps me uh, that may be useful. There's a con concept of embeddedness in a given network. Uh, so uh, there is a whole set of literature about network embeddedness, which uh, might be useful to be aware of, at least uh, theoretically. And that translates also into numerically, mathematically driven, uh, me network measurements that we are not really observing here for the sake of time and uh, the necessity to focus on digital social networks, but um, this is a uh, this is a very important line of research that for those of you who want to expand uh, after this class, it's absolutely uh, recommended. Thank you, Dominic. So, who's most central here? Who wants to take a guess? 
I think it's um, I think it's Conrad. This can maybe this can be considered a kind of a ego network. And uh, for instance, Conrad may be a politician, and the two clusters we visualize may be maybe a local community and a and uh, an advocacy group, uh, which both relate to the politician uh, with uh, different uh, interests. But I may be wrong. Diego in the chat suggests that Linda is most central on the basis of what we talked about, followed by Tim and Sue, and that Conrad is a weak tie linking together to otherwise separate networks. Any other I thoughts? May, yes. I may, well, I, I think that, you know, <laughs> this pretty much, it, it's about what, what we are looking at. And of course, if we are looking at the degree centrality, then of course, uh, the answer is Linda. But then you have Conrad, which is basically a gatekeeper here. Yeah. He's a bridge connecting two clusters. And I'm not sure yes. whether this can be seen as an ego network. I, I don't know about that, it. it that's maybe, not I, the case, I suppose. But uh, I mean, I, that I don't know. Can, <laughs> can be discussed. But uh, so it, it basically comes down to, to the type of measure that we are looking at. And I think Absolutely. that if we really want to understand it, we typically try to consider as many measures as we can. And the, the question is, what is it that is actually circulating through this particular network? Because at that point, you can really understand the relevance of the arrows, for example, the direction of what is arriving where. But without that information, it comes down to, you know, to generic interpretations of statistical uh, data. So I think uh, Dominic said it all. I don't need to add anything. That was really good. Thank you very much. So, but I, I, in, in a way also what Diego says is appropriate because um, Conrad is quite relevant here, uh, despite he will appear not as a, a top uh, scorer in, uh, in a number of, uh, for, for instance, in the context of degree centrality. That's my point here. And I think Dominic summarized it quite nicely. Uh, it depends on what we are looking for uh, and, and we can employ different centrality measures, and that's one way of doing this. Um, if we employ degree centrality, as Diego points out, Linda uh, appears to be the most central. Also, Rick, I think, appears to be quite central. Um, and then Tim. So we can have, uh, you know, numerically pin down these these differences, uh, but we should not be content with that. Uh, especially when we have digital networks, as we are about to see in a moment, these uh, kinds of uh, interpretative uh, inductive reasoning that we can employ using a network in front of us uh, is uh, is important and conrad it matters here because uh, is uh, exactly uh, a bridge uh, so uh, the easiest way to show how certain nodes can be very important in instrumental in making sure that a certain the two different groups can be connected uh, with uh, uh, with one another and therefore relevant in terms of how certain information can trans can transfer sorry from uh, the Sue cluster to the Linda cluster. And again, these two, let's familiarize with this word too, these two are clusters. And there's a whole set of clustering uh, reasonings that we are not going to do today, but uh, clusters matter here and we are going to see that matter, these matters also even more in the context of digital research because how uh, these different nodes uh, get together. Now, of course, this is a very silly, you know, textbook uh, kind of uh, uh, graph, but uh, uh, when we translate this into large data sets, the way in which certain nodes go together with others, as my YouTube uh, victims uh, know, uh, <laughs> since the day one of this summer school, um, as uh, we've discussed this, uh, matters. This matters a lot in understanding why, uh, these different users are related to one another. So let's continue because we have different slides and I don't want to be uh, late. So, and again, very, and this is the final one, uh, network relations. 
so the structural properties of the network are also quite important, not just at the level of users. We've got to that already, so I don't spend much time. Uh, network relations are often displayed in clusters, which means groupings of uh, users, sorry, not people, uh, because we're not sure if they're people, uh, that occur on the basis of given criteria. And in the context of digital social research, we'll uh, see that uh, this takes different uh, ways of expressing. Sometimes we talk about community detection, uh, and so in the context of JFI, for instance, that we are about to see, we'll use the expression modularity. Modularity is the measurement on JFI that allows us to uh, group different nodes uh, in a network together and uh, allows us to also move from the quantitative to the qualitative side because it actually tells us uh, that these uh, different uh, data points are connected for a reason. And therefore, it may be the case for us to explore which reason, which reasons, plural, uh, are there for uh, data points to actually be uh, connected with one another. So that's quite important. And also, this allows us, depending on the structural properties of our network, to identify bridges and brokers. Bridges are nodes that connect to different clusters of groups, uh, or groups, sorry, like Conrad before. And a broker is similar to a bridge, but slightly different in that it is a node which facilitates the flow of information between different nodes. So a bridge is also a broker, generally. Uh, a broker is not necessarily a bridge. This is a theoretical point here, but that becomes clear when we are looking at, uh, at networks. This is another example that I think I will skip for time reasons. <coughs> But that I leave here to, uh, if you want to play after this uh, lecture with uh, a bit of reasoning of who certain, why certain nodes are important in this network and who are the most important ones. Let's get into, into the mix uh, with digital data right now. That's, uh, that's better. So in practice, traditionally, social network analysis uh, develops out of uh, relational matrices, like the very simple and silly one that I have here on my screen, uh, that are generated by means of questionnaires, uh, which contain name generator questions, which means typically to do a network analysis data set, you uh, would need a questionnaire uh, that you uh, administer to a group of people. And within that questionnaire, there would be one or more questions uh, whereby you ask use your respondents to uh, name other people. Then you import this data into a matrix, into a spreadsheet, and uh, you could visualize that uh, before uh, social media, uh, before Jeffy, I would say, uh, through softwares like UCINet or, or Aura, which is not, which is like the hipster version of UCINet, uh, let's say. <coughs> so um, this is how typically uh, social network analysis was, was done. And the people who did social network analysis in the 70s and 80s actually have a, a experience of this. And it is quite fascinating to remember this because this was quite a hard work, I think. Uh, and uh, and it, it was very labor intensive to actually be able to produce a network analysis of uh, meaningful network analysis with, um, with very you know, uh, manual techniques. Today, fortunately, for uh, social media, we can are. I, yes. I ask you just to. Absolutely. It, uh, those uh, notes seems uh, it is interesting, but uh, not so obvious. Sorry, say again. I, I did not get the question. Please. Um, what is the meaning of uh, these uh, ones and zeros? Sorry, you're right. I forgot to say this in the enthusiasm of uh, moving on to digital networks. Finally, I forgot to say this. This is quite important. Thank you, Erasmo. So the matrix that you see um, in the spreadsheet here, uh, the zero and ones uh, determine at a very basic level the existence of a connection. So um, Mark and Anna, for instance, if you can see here, are uh, they have a zero between them, so it means that they're not connected. But uh, from, uh, or in, a, in that particular sense, uh, that uh, there is no uh, tie between Anna and Mark. Uh, no, there is a tie, actually. This is here. Uh, between, that goes from uh, uh, Anna to Mark, but that doesn't go from Mark to Anna. So zero indicates the presence of a tie, and uh, the, the absence of a tie, and one indicates the presence of a tie. Does that make it better? Yes. Okay, 
So this is, uh, this is how uh, you translate uh, name generator questions into spreadsheets annually. So the existence of a tie is usually given by uh, one in the context of the matrix and the absence of a tie by a zero. As I said, this is very labor intensive and fortunately uh, with online social networks, we do not have to do all this uh, because we are, as Norge Marra says, in the context of network and social data. So they are natively network data that we just need to figure out how to process. And how do we do that? Well, we know a bit of that story. We need softwares or scripts that allow us to collect uh, data uh, and on the basis of uh, code, uh, either produced by us or uh, automatically set up into a piece of software, we are able to download network data, network information uh, on the basis of our query. And this generally uh, gets translated into a CSV file, which is a spreadsheet, uh, an Excel format uh, that is um, text, uh, based, so it uh, can be read as a text. CSV stands for comma separated values. So it's a bunch of text separated by commas at a very simple level uh, that can be actually read as a spreadsheet or imported in a software for the network visualization like Jeffy. In the context of digital networks, nodes are individual users or can be also other entities because we can do a network of hashtags uh, and the point here is the infrastructural way in which data and metadata are constructed by platforms allows us to reconstruct the connections between these different digital objects. Uh, and uh, from a theoretical point of view, of course, this translates into understanding network relations between people, but also between brands, between commercial accounts uh, or non-human actors. This is quite important too, to remember that when we are looking at network uh, relations in digital contexts, we typically tend to have users, but not exclusively. We can also uh, have networks that combine human and non-human uh, users, uh, which means bots. Uh, a bot is an automated machine uh, that uh, essentially is a software application that runs automated tasks and especially uh, for uh, stuff that uh, Guido showed us yesterday uh, to look after bots and make sure uh, that there are, there are ways to uh, actually detect bots in the context of large digital networks. And this is quite important to do because especially in context of public opinion, for instance, uh, we have that uh, actors or group of actors employ bots to make sure that certain information circulates uh, more uh, than others. And um, if uh, for those of you who are uh, passionate about uh, uh, American politics, this morning we have Fauci leaks, uh, which uh, is a set of uh, emails that apparently have been leaked uh, or uh, actually uh, released uh, on the basis of a freedom of information request uh, that, that are now uh, uh, de developing into all kinds of conspiracy theories about the origins of uh, the disease, the COVID disease and the virus. So uh, I'm pretty sure that one uh, who wants to um, analyze this flow of information on Twitter would need to search for bots and make sure that uh, uh, bot detection algorithms are employed on the data in order to make sure that anomalies in the flow of information are well highlighted. This is a compute computational process that I leave Guido eventually if, if he wants to explain to those of you who are interested in that because it gets to a degree of computational uh, competency that is not necessarily mine, but um, you, you have to know and, be aware, and aware, be aware that this exists. Okay, first example of um, social network analysis with digital data. Um, this is a, um, a network of channels uh, on uh, Brexit that was uh, collected in 2018 uh, and that wanted to reconstruct the flow of information, actually the relevance of news sources on YouTube uh, under the tag Brexit. So um, I show you uh, later a bit about how uh, we co can collect this kind of data set. 
but essentially what we have done here is what uh, we uh, collected this data. We create, we of course manage the data set and make sure that uh, we, um, that means readable. And what we were looking for was to uh, find out clusters of uh, channels that uh, were together for a reason. So we found out that uh, there were different clusters, which are mm, here visualized in different colors. This is something you can do on Jeffy. And uh, we found out that uh, this, is, this is a network based on degree centrality, of course. We found out that uh, quite interestingly, uh, there is a lot of different uh, um, groups here. Uh, there is one on uh, Russia today. There is a Russia today cluster here, uh, which we didn't expect to find. So there may be a reason for that. We have a vice cluster, which uh, is quite relevant, which tells us a bit about how uh, relevant are uh, these kinds of informational sources in the context of the internet, as opposed to more traditional ones, such as which are present anyway. We have CNN, we have a BBC cluster in green down there. We have a Guardian cluster down here. Uh, so you can see that this gives us a quite a illustrative picture of Brexit sources on YouTube uh, at the time, uh, 2018, where of course it was not pre-referendum, but still it was a time where, uh, if you remember, uh, negotiations about how to um, uh, for the British uh, um, country to uh, leave the EU actually could uh, could be done. Interestingly. This uh, second visualization is the same data with betweenness centrality measures employed. Uh, this gives us a different, uh, a different kind of visualization, uh, which highlights even more uh, the relevance of um, the, um, the Russia Today cluster, but it also brings more centrally European uh, channels, European EU-based channels, which are not so central in the other visualization. So we have European Commission cluster here, and we have a Euronews cluster here, uh, black and, uh, and light blue. Uh, this is quite interesting because uh, I use this example precisely to show that depending on which centrality measures uh, you are employing, the pictures and the visualizations of your networks may change. So in the context of uh, sorry, this uh, degree centrality, uh, we have that, um, of course, we can make some inferences on the basis of uh, our graph. And if we move to betweenness, which, uh, as said, uh, is uh, the measure that allows us to know a bit more about who, which nodes are uh, able to intermediate information in our, um, in our context. Uh, then it tells us a completely different story, perhaps. In this case, uh, we can speculate about what this means on the basis of existing debates about Brexit and news sources that, of course, our potential paper, in this sense, would, uh, would contribute to. Uh, very important, which I forgot to say, the size of these balls here, the nodes, depends on the degree centrality, on the measure of centrality, sorry, that you're looking at. So the bigger uh, the ball here, the, the node, uh, the higher the score. Eigenvector centrality, third picture uh, with the same data set here, and look at how the vice uh, cluster becomes relevant here. Eigenvector centrality means that for some reason on YouTube, users uh, find that uh, this is, of course, our inference uh, on YouTube, people find that the Vice uh, News uh, Network uh, was uh, particularly reputable as a, a news source uh, in relation to the Brexit debate in 2018. And there may be reasons to it, which we don't know, uh, but we can speculate. There may be demographic reasons, for instance. This is probably a, a set of channels that are uh, watched most commonly by a certain demographic. And of course, we can continue our uh, inspection here on a more qualitative basis, for instance, by looking at the individual videos that maybe from these channels have been circulated more and look at the comments under those videos to find out whether our uh, interpretation is correct so that we are looking at a very peculiar demographic that uh, finds informational sources about Brexit, so to speak, slightly away from traditional sources and more into, uh, again, 
mainstream but hipster, so to speak, sources like Vice News or Motherboard. So you can see these are the same data. This is the same data set that uh, eventually uh, tells potentially different stories. The point here, and I emphasize this, we talked about this yesterday with Alessandro, I emphasize this today. The point is your research network dictates these decisions. So depending on what you're looking for, you will have to apply a certain perspective to your data analysis. And of course, this will drive the choice of measurements to employ and the choice of visualization that you will end up having. This is another example of a, a non-human uh, network. Uh, it's a network of hashtags around the IKEA uh, account on Instagram uh, that uh, uh, is included in our book. And it's a uh, uh, courtesy also, I must say, of Lucia Bainotti, who uh, was uh, helpful here in, in uh, developing this, uh, who was very uh, uh, instrumental in making sure that this visualization is as good as you can see it, because uh, this matters too. Um, so you can see that uh, different uh, hashtag groups uh, can uh, can be uh, coalescing around IKEA Italia, uh, which is a brand, or a, uh, you know we can see it as a brand, we can see it as a as a company, we can see it as a set of cultural practices, which is what I find more interesting in this network. If we look at the IKEA uh, network here of hashtags uh, that are used on Instagram around uh, IKEA uh, content, this is something that to a degree can be, but not necessarily as easily. Uh, done uh, today too, despite Instagram closures uh, of the API, we can see that uh, alongside the uh, traditional or like expected um, groups of hashtags that we may find, there are cultural practices visible here. Consumer practices from a cultural perspective are highly visible in this picture uh, because we have um, the um, set of uh, uh, green uh, hashtags here that are employed uh, specifically specifically related to home decor. We have Shabby Chic, for instance. Uh, we have interiors, homes, home decor. I mean, all the set of hashtags around um, this, this topic. So one who wants to understand, for instance, IKEA uh, decor cultures could isolate posts that belong to this cluster. Then we have um, this purple one up at the top, which uh, actually tells us about uh, social situations. Domenica, Natale, which means Christmas, Sunday. So the context of uh, enjoying one's uh, private spaces in the context of, uh, and then for probably the decor uh, of it, uh, in the context of a so very social practice and, uh, and a cultural one too. Then we have a typical social media uh, phenomenon here, which you can see, I, I'm trying to highlight it here, like for like, like for likes on the top of the network in, uh, in uh, pink. Um, this is a typical process that happens when uh, uh, you analyze these networks, you will find that people use a certain hashtag uh, only to find more followers. And this is, uh, this is typical to many. And of course, IKEA makes no exception here uh, because there are a lot of users then who use uh, the IKEA hashtag only to find uh, other users that uh, would follow them or that exchange likes. Uh, I'm not sure if still this, is, this is still a thing. Lucia, maybe you will you have a better pulse than I do on, on Instagram cultures, but uh, um, you will probably tell us a little bit more maybe, but uh, uh, I'm not sure if this is something that, that continues to happen or if this was, you know, uh, something of five years ago because of Instagram stories. That's why I'm asking. Instagram stories have changed a little bit of these practices. I'm not sure if still this is a thing. I don't know if Lucia is here. Maybe she wants to pitch in otherwise. Sorry, there will be your lecture to, to follow. So uh, we'll leave it at that. And of course, also um, in orange on the left-hand side, you have uh, IKEA uh, cultures around uh, pets. So dog, cats, and uh, uh, the whole set of uh, 
uh, IKEA products that relate to pets. And down at the back, you also have another consumer culture practice, uh, food, because IKEA sells food. Uh, and unexpectedly or not, perhaps you have um, that people talk about IKEA food quite significantly. And then uh, near to that, you have kits as well. So of course, products for kids. So you see how a very simple visualization like this, if done well, like this one, uh, actually tells us a lot about cultural practices that concur to the meaning in this case of a brand uh, and to identify the different uh, constituencies perhaps and audiences that make uh, brands uh, eventually relevant on Instagram and they concur to the meaning and the significance of a given brand. This is another one that we've done uh, uh, for uh, um, with, with Alessandro on uh, uh, crowdfunding. So in this case, this network tells us a bit about, uh, this is an, a Twitter network about uh, hashtags, again, non-human users. This is another example of non-human networks um, that, uh, um, that um, tells us about um, different cultures that concur to uh, the crowdfunding movement. This is from 2014. So back then crowdfunding was relatively new and, and there was a lot of uh, thoughts around uh, crowdfunding. So we can see that there are the indie people in the center of the network. Um, so fundraising for independent film projects, independent music projects, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the left-hand side in red, we have the startups, So the entrepreneurs, the people who use uh, crowdfunding to build their own entrepreneurial activity. Uh, and we have the tech community uh, that discusses them on the right-hand side in, uh, in yellow. Uh, we have music, a music subcluster at uh, uh, the bottom uh, right of the network. So you see these different, again, these, these uh, networks allow us to uh, develop uh, strong visualizations of cultural practices. And that's why these are very enriching, not simply in quantitative terms, but also in qualitative terms, because they tell us or they indicate to us uh, where to search for cultural practices and meanings and continue our uh, inquiry. So when we move on to the qualitative level, again, this can be very illustrative and tells us on where to look for tweets, for instance, to do content analysis. Lucia will tell us about content analysis later this morning. So um, perhaps we can extract a bunch of tweets and do content analysis on one of these clusters that allows us to uh, understand more what is going on in one of them. There was someone who uh, was talking, is that a mistake or, a, or a, an attempt to ask yeah. something? Yes. Diego. Yes. Um, a question, you know, this looks beautiful, but uh, for from the very limited experience I have, uh, this is like the AMP version, uh, you know, with a lot of information. So the question is, uh, how often you have uh, the result of the analysis that is already easy to interpret and how often you need to do that stuff, which is intensively qualitative already in order to let the right information stand out from the otherwise, how can I call it, uh, noise? Or... Noise, yes. That's a very good question. It takes some time, of course, to, to get to this level. Uh, this, this level, not, not intended as a high level of source, but to this level of precision in being able to, uh, it takes practice with Jeffy. That's, of, that's something I've experienced myself as a painful process. Um, so, so it takes a little bit of time, but um, then it is not that uh, that difficult. Uh, if I made it, I think everybody can because I have no special quality in, in any in any of this. Uh, but yes, there is. It takes a little bit of time. It's not immediately straightforward. Uh, although sometimes it is. Sometimes maybe a simple modularity uh, calculation and visualization like I'm, what I'm showing you in a, in a moment uh, can lead already to, to insights and, uh, and therefore can be a gateway to more research in a certain direction. I'm not sure if I addressed your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, totally fine. What you're saying is that by learning how to use the software, you can uh, have the right information, send out uh, and uh, 
put on the background of the noise that would make a beautiful graphs like this much more difficult to read. Yes, okay. yes. If this might be perfect solution for consulting projects when we want to talk to brands, clients, etc. Uh, what about uh, academic research when uh, these kind of operations might be, I mean, the beauty of these uh, from some reviewers might be that it's automated, so no subjectivity, but then you introduce a lot of manipulations that are subjective or interpretive or however we want to construe them. And uh, how much should you document these procedures? in the methodology for section of any paper, for example. I think that uh, this is, I, 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 am, I don't share that this is manipulation. I share that this is between analysis and interpretation. So it's uh, very good that you do this, but then how much of no. you report in your methodology? It's a, it's a fair point. Uh, the methodological sections of articles like uh, this, in this case, this was a book. So uh, on uh, uh, this is in the book of, uh, where you know, the whole chapter is essentially about what we've done. So uh, that was easy. But when it comes to a journal article, of course, it's a bit of a headache because um, there's a lot to, to justify. And you're right. Uh, we And I also apply this as a reviewer myself of papers like this. Uh, I want to see the whole thing and I try to uh, make sure that when I write articles that include these visualizations, I describe a process that gets to that point uh, in a step-by-step -step manner. Uh, I, I am a fan of transparency in this sense, so that precisely uh, it doesn't seem to be the result of some kind of magic that I applied, which there isn't eventually. So um, yes, methodologically, this needs to be, to get to this point, and um, I, I emphasize this, this is quite important, um, it, it is important that from data collection to the production of a visualization, um, we keep a record of what we have done. So that can be not only included in a methodological section, but also replicated. Because sometimes reviewers ask uh, things that, that are not there in the first place. So uh, maybe a reviewer gets this graph and says, oh, why this is important. I mean, can you elaborate further this network to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, we are, um, you know, we can visualize this better, right? And so you have to go back. And if you don't have a, a, a route, uh, a track, uh, step-by-step -step, uh, um, process uh, in place, then, uh, then it is not easy to replicate uh, this twice. So um, it is important to, to keep track of every single step along the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was important. So another example that uh, uh, actually starts from the data collection here that I, I say um, that I show here because it's quite uh, fun also too sometimes. So I, um, I would uh, I want to show you the process. And I think Diego, that your point was uh, actually very timely because it comes after, before this, just before this. So thank you. Um, so. This tool that you have uh, the link on is uh, similar to others uh, in, uh, in that I show you later. So uh, from the same uh, um, researcher, Bernard Reeder, who is uh, an important digital media scholar, but also uh, a coder. So someone who actually does uh, his own softwares, uh, lucky him. And um, this tool allows to reconstruct networks of artists on Spotify. So it is also a playful way to learn these networks uh, and how they work because um, you can search for your favorite uh, musician, assuming uh, finding, uh, you know, having a favorite artist is still a thing. I know for young people, they are more on moods, but, uh, um, but you know, and uh, I, I, the example we are doing here is with uh, Queen Beyonce. Uh, who um, I hope you like as much as I do. And uh, um, so we've, uh, we want to reconstruct the artist network of uh, Beyonce here. So we go on this, uh, I'm, I have a series of screenshots, so don't worry, you don't have to do anything. Uh, we can go on this, uh, on this link and this will bring us, brings us to this page. Uh, we input the uh, name of the artist in the very daunting but uh, effective interface. Uh, we have to, of course, disclaim who, which Beyonce actually we uh, uh, need to, to find. Uh, so the first one uh, in this case, because of course there's all kinds of other uh, possible Beyonces. This is an ego network, just to be clear before, you know, so we use the 
theory that we have talked about earlier this morning. Uh, this is an ego network. Uh, we are doing a Beyonce's ego network on Spotify. So we click on the right Beyonce here and uh, uh, we are uh, given a picture like this, which makes no sense. I mean, really, it's what it is. What uh, we need to do is, as the, the red circle uh, indicates, download the network file. This network file is in GDF format. So most of, of these softwares uh, produce files uh, with an extension, GDF, that is suited for Jeffy. Jeffy is the network visualization software that uh, uh, people uh, who do this kind of job uh, most commonly uses. Uh, so um, it is helpful that this is automatically openable in Jeffy. So that's what we are going to do. We download the file and import it in Jeffy because this can be helpful if we want to play, but if we want to make this a piece of research for some reason, uh, this is the kind of visualization that we see here, of course, doesn't say much. So we go on Jeffy and we open the graph file uh, that is here. Uh, I'm showing you know, a little bit of a step-by-step -step guide. Uh, and of course you will have these slides, so don't worry. You can reconstruct this process by yourselves at home um, or, or later today with your groups, absolutely. So um, open the graph file and uh, um, generally your, if everything is fine, you're given back a, a, a screen like this, which tells no issue fine during import. That's uh, as good as it gets. And this uh, brief uh, screen, this, uh, this uh, um, window tells us also the amount of nodes we have in our network. In this case, uh, we have collected 662 other artists that are connected to, uh, to Beyonce on Spotify. That is an important disclaimer I have to make. Um, and uh, these are connected by 6,500 and counting edges. In this case, we use a non-directed file uh, because we are not interested in finding directions, but if the uh, data collection allows, so if the ways in which you set up your data collection in this case is not possible, but for other instruments, it may be, uh, uh, you can also use directed files, uh, absolutely. So um, very important point, like on YouTube, Spotify has something that we call recommender algorithm. So the recommended algorithmic system is the way in which we can process this network data set because we can make a query to the API of Spotify in this case, uh, like on YouTube. And uh, in, uh, uh, by means of that query, we obtain the network relations that are based on the recommender algorithm at the back of these platforms, which means that uh, these platforms recognize content so in this case, artists as related to one another. And in that case, it is content that uh, artists that uh, are recommended to other users by the system uh, on the basis of essentially two reasons. Uh, one is a computational reason. So uh, they are similar because of the metadata that, uh, embed, that is embedded in each of them. And uh, uh, the other one is social which is why we are here. So um, they are related because uh, people tend to listen to artists uh, that are similar to one another. So uh, the platform recommends artists that are similar also on the basis of what other users have listened to in a row. So this is how recommender system works. And the same goes for YouTube, of course. We uh, watch, we uh, can download network data sets about YouTube content uh, on the basis of uh, relatedness properties. These, related pro these relatedness properties are the combination of computational features of the data points that we are downloading on the one hand and social practices because uh, we get to know that uh, a certain uh, video has been watched by after another and it is the result of a social viewing practice. Uh, problem is, 
uh, which may we need a bit of uh, justification in an article again, uh, or uh, th there is plenty of research now that helps doing that, of course, is the problem here is that we don't know the uh, exact balance of these two, because this is a algorithmic secrecy, I'm afraid, that no Spotify or YouTube would actually tell us about. So uh, we know that the result of their relatedness is a combination of computational and social features because of the very few documents that we have at our disposal about the algorithms on Spotify and YouTube and how they work. But we don't know exactly the combination of, of these. We don't know exactly you know, 70% and 30%. We don't know that. So we have to be content that this is a combination of computational and social practices. And in fact, the social practices that we can understand through these are quite illustrative anyway. Uh, so we have, uh, we can infer uh, cultural patterns of consumptions quite, uh, uh, quite uh, clearly uh, from that, even though part of it is purely computational and we don't know how much, but it doesn't really matter in my view. I mean, it matters that we know that this is a combination. It would be very helpful if we know uh, the extent to which these two combine, but uh, it is important to know, uh, and, and, and in the end, it doesn't really uh, change that much if we knew. This is not to discount platforms for, for this. Um, so, is that all clear? This was a, cl this was a key passage, so um, let me know if this is not uh, clear enough. Maybe, maybe if we go on, you'll understand why I'm saying, yes, it is important, but at the end of the day, not too much. Well, yes. actually, I have, a, I have a question. It's yes, please. pretty clear what you said, also about uh, the fact that uh, we're, getting, we're getting data from a platform and there are both computational logic and social logics, basically that structure the ties uh, mm -hmm. between, between user and... Uh, and products, basically. But um, at the same time, I, if, if you could please elaborate uh, a little bit uh, on on the goals of um, mm -hmm. of the of a potential research, so we can do that. But uh, you know, what's the aim? So what what do we get? Why it can be useful? You know, on a sociological level, on a theoretical yeah. level, and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, of course, the examples I'm making are purely um, to, to illustrate the process. Now, uh, as Ricardo points out correctly, we need a research question to begin with, and we need to know what we are looking for. Uh, and of course, uh, in, in this case, um, we can potentially say that, for instance, we, what we would like to reconstruct in the context of uh, this example about Beyonce is the uh, cultures uh, that in the different cultural uh, phenomena that concur to the uh, the ways in which people listen to Beyonce as a broader uh, research question that we can set. Uh, perhaps a question that could be easily understand, that could be easily answered, relatively easily answered in uh, the context of uh, this very simple and uh, exemplifying, just purely exemplifying data collection is the extent to which music genres, for instance, uh, are in the picture when it comes to listening practices around Beyonce on Spotify. Uh, do people, um, do, do people actually, sorry, do um, uh, artists gather uh, in the context of Beyonce's ego network on the basis of uh, established genre conventions or do they do this for other reasons? So these are the kinds of uh, questions in pa this particular case that one should have when it starts a kind of research like this. Um, and of course, it depends on the research question, again, one individually might have. And uh, there can be things that can be done. And of course, uh, conclusions that can be taken and others that cannot be taken because the data do not allow this. This is a rather reasonable. Does it make any better? Yes, I have a question too. Uh, yes. Could it be interesting to combine this kind of uh, of, um, of research, uh, which is calling the Spotify uh, API, uh, with another one uh, based on maybe on Twitter, just to get what's the cultural imaginary 
of the of the artist because in this case calling the spotify api we just see the ties with other artists but what what i think it may be interesting is um, is describing uh, which are the non musical uh, uh, features uh, around uh, uh, around absolutely the you can certainly do that uh, in the spirit of following the medium though uh, I would suggest that if you want to do this kind of research, uh, you either maintain uh, some kind of coherence in the sense uh, of co collecting data in a way that uh, is similar. So, for instance, you could, you know, start from uh, the Twitter account of Beyonce, assuming that this will lead you to find the meaningful data. Um, or you would find something in the original data collection that points you to a different medium, which can be Twitter, but can be also something else. Um, perhaps YouTube. Perhaps uh, YouTube take, will take us different from Spotify. YouTube has comments. And of course, comments can be very uh, insightful as to the cultural practices. So, you know, underpinning a certain, uh, for instance, listening practice uh, of a music artist. So in this case, I'm using these examples to, you know, focus on networks a little bit more on the technical side, but yes, that's absolutely something we can do. Actually, there is an article uh, that I reviewed a few years back that does something similar. Uh, perhaps if I find it, I can, uh, I can send it to you. Thank you, thank you. So let me, let me show you the whole thing and then uh, you can ask me everything. So we have uh, this, um, this network now that we have imported in Jeffy. And usually when you import this in Jeffy, you find this odd, uh, uh, terrifying picture coming to you, which is this uh, set of notes, which is quite, uh, uh, quite daunting. But um, you shouldn't be worried because we have to work this out uh, and, uh, and it becomes understandable. So don't worry about this. It's going to be easy and clear. So um, this, uh, this is typical. This is fine. So um, one thing I suggest to do first before you do anything else, or you can do it later, of course, but uh, uh, you know, the bigger your data set becomes, uh, the more difficult it will be to export your data into a spreadsheet because you need uh, uh, computing power and uh, good luck with that. So um, in this case, I tend to have, you know, the first, what I do first is to uh, go to the data table as soon as the data is imported in Jeffy and export back the spreadsheet in CSV format so that I can do other analysis on Excel. For instance, here there is genres. So perhaps genres as recognized by the platform, I'm following Massimiliano's logic here, can be uh, an indication of something on a qualitative level, can be materials that we can analyze, uh, but we cannot do this in Jeffy. We have to export our data and put it in an Excel file. Uh, and that is where we can do some content analysis or uh, text analysis. And I leave this to Ilir and Julia after me this morning. So don't forget to do this. Um, the, um, the exporting back is, uh, I think, a key process, key element in the process. So let's assume you want to calculate the I'm sorry. Quality. Yes. Uh, can I have a question regarding the export? Um, yes. This export will give us a list of the nodes. It will uh, give us exactly this uh, table in a spreadsheet format. Yeah. So, so is it helpful to extract the edges as well? If you want, why not? Um, it depends again on what you're searching, but I guess for... Uh, well, I, w I yes. was thinking if you do some adjustments um, with your CSV file uh, in Excel, and then you want to upload it back, then yes, you, you can. the edges as well, so that yeah. the file works, right? Yes, so, definitely, how? you can do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can do that for sure. Uh, it depends on how this uh, uh, this is structured. But yes, if you see on the right and on the left hand side, you have edges too. So you can also work on the edges if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No problem. So let's assume we want to do a degree centrality calculation. Uh, in this case, very simple, average degree, nothing complicated. We have no um, need to, to give ourselves a headache. Uh, we calculate, so we on the right-hand side of our uh, interface, we have average degree, we click on run, and we get back a report, which to be fair, says, you know, just a scatter plot, which gives a kind of indication. Personally, I tend to ignore the scatter plot. I'm sorry, quantitative people. 
I don't really find this insightful in any particular way uh, for 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 uh, the kind of work that I usually do. But there may be someone who actually finds this insightful, and uh, and therefore you know if you want, this is also downloadable. But I'm not going to spend time on it. So degree centrality. Then uh, we begin to work on the visualization. We have our degree centrality that at this point becomes helpful as a ranking. So we can click on ranking here and choose an attribute. So which means we will be able to visualize the network on the basis of the ranking attribute that we have set. So in this case, degree. Um, and in down back, now I'm going to, we can use also other parameters, as you can see, that are set naturally. So the number of followers, for instance, which is a form of in degree, of course. Uh, we can use that too. We can use genres. We can uh, cluster these uh, contents on the basis of genres. We can do all of that, absolutely. Uh, but what we want to, um, to do here is to focus on the degree. So very simply. And we run um, at the... Um, at the second level, we run the modularity. So we can cluster our contents uh, on the basis, uh, so we can visualize it on the basis of the degree, but we will cluster it and also visualize it, of course, on the basis of how different uh, nodes are similar to one another. So we run the modularity score uh, in the same way. So we have it here on the right hand side, we run and we click OK and we get a report back and we can also partition then our uh, our visualization on the basis of our modularity class. So this is something quite simple. I think uh, we have um, we have a visual we will have a visualization that distinguishes our users, ranking them on the basis of their degree centrality, and partitions the graph on the basis of the modularity class they belong to. So our expectation is that we will have bigger and smaller nodes partitioned on the basis of the clustering. To make sense visually of this also, uh, we can choose a color. So uh, in the ranking, we can go on degree and change the color uh, so that it becomes a little bit more meaningful. And this is as much uh, creative as you can get here, at least for now. So you can choose the palette you like most. and uh, and. Uh, I tend to find that the most, uh, I, I, I encourage you to, you, to, to uh, avoid using nuances because nuances are quite, I've done this mistake before and then, you know, I never do it again. So stark different colors and this is always better. And then we run our visualization algorithms. In this uh, uh, menu uh, you have on the left-hand side, you have visualization algorithms. Um, there are different ones. Uh, the most common ones are fruchterman Reingold, which, uh, which is here. Um, then Ifan Hu, which is also quite uh, common to use, and uh, Force Atlas and Force Atlas 2, which are two different variations. To be fair, um, I should know exactly what each of these algorithms do uh, to the networks, but I tend to forget. So <laughs> uh, I know that, uh, um, for instance, um, Force Atlas allows to, if I remember well, distance the nodes a little bit better. Uh, other uh, algorithms uh, like Frutterman Rheingold allow to emphasize the clustering of the nodes. Uh, most of the times I do it with, uh, you know, despite I know a little bit about this, uh, I do it uh, in a trial and error. So I apply one and then see what happens. Uh, this is as honest as it gets. And uh, um, there is, however, a literature about this. And uh, I encourage you to, to look into it if you're uh, keen to explore more. This is um, the work of Tommaso Venturini in particular, uh, a very good uh, uh, digital media researcher at Sciences Po in Paris. And uh, um, he has published a lot about these algorithms, mostly because he created a few of them. So uh, he has uh, you know, extensive knowledge about them. So you can see the individual features of each, uh, of each one of them. And the result uh, would be something like this. Yes, please. No, just, uh, just a question. All those algorithms are just about uh, the visualization of yes. that, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the way in which you emphasize whether the nodes are better 
cluster together or more scattered or uh, the different uh, edges are, um, are uh, more uh, amassed one to one, on one to another or more clearly laid out. It's uh, again, I, I take it as a game, to be honest. I play and I click and I and see what happens, really. Okay, thanks. And generally, you find something like this, which is pretty uh, difficult to understand at first. Uh, and of course, as I said to Diego before, it is a process, so a trial and error process. And sometimes you get to uh, to uh, to play a little bit more than than uh, this in order to get to a meaningful visualization. This is quite huge, by the way. So um, we we can see how these different clusters, which are generally, I mean, I know it's pretty relatively invisible here, are generally kept together by genres. But they tend to um, what this this picture tells us is that they tend to uh, belong more or less to the same big cluster, which is pop music. So pop music has a sort of like super generic bunch of different kinds of songs. So it's not particularly insightful from a theoretical point of view, but one may want to then filter out content. I'll show you in a minute what it means. Um, sorry, I'm a bit longer than expected, but I think it's important. Um, then uh, uh, filtering out content means to reduce the, the amount of data that we are looking at here. And of course, to emphasize some of these clusters even more. For the Italians in the room, you can do the same with uh, Calcutta, uh, an indie artist. Uh, and this is quite more insightful, I think, because if you do exactly the same process, but uh, using Calcutta instead of uh, Beyonce, uh, this is an indie article, this is an indie artist, and you can find quite easily that you have genre or relatively genre conventionally uh, dif different genres here. Uh, we have uh, on the uh, right hand side in uh, um, in orange, we have the uh, sort of first wave of indie artists uh, who, we, who were uh, young when I was young. Uh, then, uh, then we have a uh, cluster of uh, hip hop uh, and uh, new, sorry, on the red hand side, you have, we have hip hop and trap uh, artists. And uh, on the top yellow, we have uh, newer indie uh, artists. So uh, it is very simple, but uh, if you are familiar with the scene, this makes a lot of sense because it can tell us that Calcutta is actually a bridge between different subcultural communities in, uh, in the music uh, listening practices in the Italian indie context. And this tells us quite, this tells the story quite, uh, quite uh, simply and quite easily. Uh, by playing in the kind of way that I showed you so far. Finally, I wanted to spend a little bit of time to show you uh, how to collect YouTube networks, uh, which is also a big part of what I do. Uh, this is the tool, the YouTube data tools that I commonly use uh, that uh, uh, looks more or less like this. Uh, it seems daunting again, but it is quite insightful. Uh, you have different things that you can do. You can download information about individual channels uh, related to a certain query, for instance, or uh, later on networks. So you have uh, the possibility to download a channel network. So a, na a network of channels, uh, in this case, connected via the feature channels and subscriptions. Um, that uh, that uh, will be able to more or less do what I showed you before with uh, the Brexit uh, channel network, a video list. So you can also download lists that can be qualitatively analyzed about uh, videos that uh, maybe you can do visual analysis on it or uh, other kinds of ethnographic content analysis, should you wish. Um, you can download video networks, which is the big thing in the in this interface, which uh, I'm going to show you in a moment. And uh, uh, then, of course, information and comments about individual videos, which is also quite insightful. And this generally becomes, for me, the next step in the analysis. So first I do a network about a certain query, and then uh, I will move on to uh, look at the comments, perhaps, uh, and then engage more qualitatively with the content of the comments. That's something I've done quite uh, quite regularly. 
So this is a, a screenshot of how I uh, set normally or how it looks like uh, when, it, when we set normally the search query uh, for a, a video network. This is the one that my friends in the YouTube group are actually using, the organic network. Um, so uh, in this case, it's a, a, it's a screenshot of, uh, of an exemplary. And this is not the, the one because we have five iterations instead of one. So usually we can put in a search query. We can decide to use a seed, which is in the middle of the, uh, of the screen. A seed is essentially a video that we can decide this query starts from. This is to create an ego network from an individual video, like we do with a user. Uh, if we instead use a search query, we search for relatedness properties on the basis of the YouTube algorithm, as I, as I explained before. Um, Iterations here means that you can uh, search for uh, different, uh, you can make different iterations of calls to the API. Uh, usually I set uh, this not to 10 because my system crashes. Uh, but um, if you get to five, for instance, you if the search query is quite popular or relatively popular, you tend to get already a lot of data. So um, you don't necessarily have to have 10 to get two decent amounts of data. And there are, of course, other smaller features, like uh, which are important anyway, but uh, uh, you can set yourselves, like uh, find the relevance, which are, uh, which is, again, to exploit the best of the recommendation algorithm. You can decide the time limit. Um, and importantly, you can decide the crawl depth, with all, which also uh, influences the amount of data you can collect. The crawl depth essentially is the uh, degree of depth you can snowball through the different content. So if you set to zero, you will only get the videos that are related at the first level to the query that you entered. So uh, if we enter the search term organic, uh, the crawl depth zero will give us the videos that are related to the search query. If we set one, we get the videos that are related to the first search query and the videos that are related to the videos that we collected at level zero. So it is a snowball sort of extra exponential, so to speak, level of uh, data collection. And this, of course, gets to uh, up to potentially crawl depth two, which means we get the videos that are uh, related to the original uh, query, and then the videos that are related to the videos that are uh, related to the search query, and then the videos that are related to the videos that are, so you can exploit the network properties to a, a degree of depth. Uh, that is quite uh, quite big. And of course, the more you go into the crawl depth, uh, the uh, more uh, data you can get and the more likely uh, your computer will crash. So do it at your own risk. And uh, um, generally, even at the crawl depth one, you tend to get a good amount of data. Uh, of course, depending on your research, uh, maybe you need more depth, but in that case, you have to be sure that uh, your computer is actually able to sustain this search and you have a lot of time. Because of course, when you start getting results, like uh, at the bottom of the screen here, you tend to have um, a lot of results. So it takes hours and I usually leave it overnight and hope for the best and go back in the morning and see if it hasn't crashed. This is something that is a sad story of my life here. Uh, like click, go do something else, go back and see that it stopped for some reason. It happens too. And again, in the same way, we can export the table. This is a bit of a repetition, so we don't really need that. But you can see that with a YouTube uh, data set, we have a lot of uh, more information. We have the view counts, we have the like counts, we have the dislike counts, which is an original feature of YouTube that could, brings us, uh, could bring us into a very different set of uh, interpretative uh, reasoning. Uh, when it comes to understanding why people dislike a certain content, this is something that we do not necessarily have as immediately and easily as on other platforms. And so you can download this and do all kinds of different qualitative analysis too. And it becomes a spreadsheet like this. Um, like this is uh, uh, what my uh, friends in the YouTube uh, group have done. So I'm, I'm, it's a compliment to them actually that I put their work in the slides. And uh, I think this is yours, Petra, right? This is what you've done. It looks like the first attempt. 
Yes, exactly. So um, the uh, you can then put back into Jeffy like we did. I want to show you this only to mention filters and then I free you for the break. Um, when you have a network like this, of course, you uh, can play with the modularity scores and uh, it can become um, quite uh, quite uh, easy as uh, we've done here to scatter out the different clusters. But maybe we are not content to the kind of content we are looking here. So what we can do is to filter out certain content on the basis of features. So um, perhaps with our modularity scores, we have clusters that are completely irrelevant to, uh, the, um, to the content. So uh, to the research question, sorry, that we have. So in that case, we can filter out um, on the basis of our modularity class. This is totally random now, but you have to set where you want. And uh, in order to do that, instead of having the statistics, um, for um, interface on, you have to have the filters interface on, which is next to it, and drag the filter that you would like to apply down in the queries segment, uh, which is immediately below, and then run this. This will filter out certain content, of course, on, maybe be careful, uh, you have to know what you're doing here, but uh, it is uh, something that can be done. And purely, I must say, in order not to, and I think Diego's point was appropriate here, in order not, in order not to uh, risk being manipulative of the data, uh, you have to uh, make sure that what you're excluding is actually something totally irrelevant, that you can easily justify as something that is totally irrelevant in case a reviewer asks. So um, just to be precise. And, and of course, this will lead into uh, a few more um, analysis. You can play with uh, the uh, visualization algorithms and we'll see what Petra and uh, the others will do. Uh, I'm actually quite curious because they are, they are doing quite a nice work on this. So I'm looking forward to it. And um, that's it for me. If you want, there is a more uh, sort of like extensive um, chapter about this in Alessandro and I's book. Um, that uh, that explains a bit more uh, in detail uh, what I showed you this morning. I was wondering, I know I kept you for 15 minutes more, but we'll um, essentially uh, recuperate these later on. Uh, and uh, uh, But I thought it was necessary to, to engage a little bit uh, more on this. As, is there any, we have four minutes, let's put it like this, for questions. Uh, otherwise, I will leave you to process this. And of course, we can chat later in the day uh, if you have any specific query. Is there any burning question? I have just one question, but it's more technical in the sense that I yes? was wondering if it would be possible to have also the video, not only the slides, to reconstruct all the all the discourse you, you did in case we want to try to use Jeffy. So you mean the video of this lecture? Yes, of the lecture, if it would be possible. I think it's not a problem. It uh, goes, uh, we have to ask the organizers, but uh, we can, uh, I think there's no problem in sharing that, at least for me. So yes, why not? Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, can I ask you uh, if uh, we can um, always find the Jeffy format file, or if not, if we can um, uh, change the format. You can create I... a, a Jeffy. Okay, let's. Uh, this is an important one. Um, if the file is formatted as a network, meaning uh, it has network properties embedded in the data, uh, a CSV file can be inputted in Jeffy. You don't need a GDF, you can use a CSV, but it has to have edges. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't recognize the file as a network file, even if it can read it. So you will only have essentially another, you know, odd Excel spreadsheet. Uh, so the file you have to have, the CSV file should contain information about edges between uh, nodes uh, and not just simply a list of nodes. Uh, so this is a formatting of the file. There are ways of doing that. There is um, a feature in the DMI, Alessandro mentioned yesterday, the DMI, suite of tools. Uh, there is a, a table to net feature. Uh, it's, a, it's a tool that is quite uh, helpful in creating uh, networks from text files, from Excel files. 
So uh, that's something one can easily create. Um, again, to your own risk. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, you're here. Uh, so uh, this this is uh, again at your own risk because it is a, a browser-based application. So if you want to create, a, if you have a big a data set and you put it into this software and you want to create a network file of all the properties, uh, then it is likely this will crash. So um, if you want, uh, what I when I used it, I used it for very simple uh, transformations so that I wanted, for instance, to know about uh, follower networks. So in that case, you put follower information and that's it. And that is a lot easier. That is a lot smaller and, uh, and generally it works. Sorry. Are there are other platforms uh, similar to the one that you show about uh, Beyonce uh, on other uh, topic, not so not only music, but other kind of topic? Such as? Mm, I don't know, fashion or... Uh, well, um, these are um, in terms of, you mean, relatedness? of content or in general to, to query the API? Uh, the first one, like- uh... Okay. So um, yes, technically you could potentially obtain information about relatedness, for instance, for all, all the platforms that are, um, they have a recommendation algorithm embedded to it. So potentially also eBay and Amazon mm -hmm. or TripAdvisor. No, TripAdvisor, does, does TripAdvisor have a- um, recommendation algorithm, I don't remember now, but anyway. So yes, technically you, you could do that. You need to either have a software that does it for you, so it collects the data for you, or be able to run a script through a platform, assuming this is possible, but uh, I'm sure if you um, want, there, there, there are ways of doing so, yeah. I'm not sure, uh, Lucia, Ilir, maybe are here, maybe they remember about uh, uh, eBay or other platforms and the possibility to download. We should ask Massimo Iroldi, he knows for sure. But yes, technically, if there is a recommendation system, you can do the same, yeah. Okay, the answer is there. It's 11 and I know you need to be powered up with coffee. So uh, I will now interrupt the sh screen share and stop the recording and thank you all for your attention. I hope it was not too too dense and uh, uh, and and that it was actually I hope insightful. Uh, if you have any questions about whatever I showed you this morning, please contact me or either uh, in Slack or in an email. And you know, in general, I'm here uh, assuming I have the answer. Sometimes I don't. So if I do, I'm happy to talk about this further. So if you agree, 15 minutes break. And then at 11.15, we have Lucia and Ilir taking charge of the class for the fun part. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.